the ruins of Laodicea, and sure enough, there's this reddish clay looking pipe that's going through the ground, through the city. So they had running water in the ancient world. Amazing. And so Laodicea would pipe the water, the cold water from Colossae, and the hot water from Hierapolis. But by the time it got to Laodicea, it had become bitter and tepid. And if you drank it, you would get sick. So Jesus is using this natural illustration to say, I want you to be like the waters that are hot in Hierapolis or the waters that are cold in Colossae because they're useful. But you, Laodicea, church, you are useful. You're like tepid, bitter, lukewarm water that will do nothing but make you sick. And so here in verse 15 and verse 16, Jesus declares the lukewarm church is useless. In verse 14, he's saying, I am the true witness. But verses 15 and 16, he's saying, I want you, lukewarm church, to be use, use, useful, not useless. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I would that you were cold or hot. And because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, uh, Pastor Dustin thought that he bought a off-brand Sprite earlier, a couple weeks ago or last week. In reality, he bought a natural carbonated water that's sweetened with stevia called Zevia. How many of you ever heard of it before? Nobody's ever heard of it? All right. Wow. Man. It's like a natural version of Coca-Cola. Are you a Pepsi or Coca-Cola person? Neither right now. Neither right now. Okay. Well, can you imagine? You go to the kitchen... And you get your, you open up your cabinet, you take your nice glass out and you set it on the counter and you go to the refrigerator and you get that nice two liter of your Pepsi Cola or your Coca Cola, whichever, whichever way you, whichever floats your boat, it doesn't bother me, brother. And then you take it, it's cold, and you pour it in there and you drink a sip and it's refreshing and it's so good. But you set it on the counter, you go outside, you mow the grass. And you, you take care of the lawn, you take care of some other errands, and you come back a few hours later, and you go, you didn't put ice in it, and it's, and it's, it's not cold anymore. It's lukewarm. Is that Coca-Cola going to be good? No, you're going to drink, and you're going to spit it out of your mouth. And so Jesus is saying to the Laodicean church that you're like this lukewarm beverage that's not worthy to be drinking or drink. And so may God help us to come before Him and say, God, I desire to be used by You. God, I want to be like these hot springs or these cold springs that can quench Your thirst or can be used for medicinal purposes. God, help us to be used by You because You are the true witness. But now check out verses 17 and 18. And the, the next transition here, we see that, that the history teaches us that the Laodicean region was a very wealthy region. I mean, just imagine they were brilliant, they were smart, they had money, they had so many resources that they literally could pipe and water from another mountain on the road and bring it all the way in. How exactly they, they got the water there, I don't know, but they had the technology because the pipes are there. But here in verse 17 and verse 18, it reminds us that these people had money. One resource speaks about how they had a large bank there. And it was used to finance for outside individuals. They had this uh, industry of making clothes as the white raiment in verse number 18 speaks of. It speaks about all these different things. It speaks about this eye salve that they had. They had these ways of, of, of not only piping in uh, water from other cities. They had banks that were loaded with gold and money and silver and bronze. They had clothing industries, uh, places you can go and buy clothes. You didn't have to make them for yourself. They had medicinal factories where you could go in, make eye salve, and you could heal your eyes of any type of ailments. They, they had it all. I mean, they were very prosperous. And what I have noticed is that prosperity oftentimes breeds a rejection of God. Even though it should pull us to God. I mean, think about this. We, in America, have more technology than the Laodiceans have. Or had. We have more money than the Laodiceans had. We have better piping systems for water than what they had. 
We can overcome this idea of bitter, tepid water through our systems with the water authority. We can overcome these things. We, have, we don't just have factories, man. We have Walmart where we can go and buy our groceries. We can buy our underwear. We can buy our socks. We can buy our t-shirts. We can buy our dresses, our suits, our ties. We can buy it all at Walmart in one place. We have it all. And just like these people were wealthy and prosperous, we need to understand that Jesus is our source for wealth. Jesus is our source for righteousness. And Jesus is our source for wellness. I mean, haven't you heard that passage, heard that name? He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord who heals us. Yes, I understand. We have hospitals and doctors and we need them. Just like here, this ISAL was a medicinal thing that they used. It was like medicine. And I'm not saying we don't need medicine. We, we need that sometimes. We do. I mean, eating a banana and drinking a shake is not always going to help you and heal you. So sometimes we've got to go to the doctor and get help. But I'm here to tell you something, that those doctors, have been, whether they acknowledge it or not, they've been given wisdom from God. And God is using them whether they know it or not. So, we understand that God, or Jesus, is our source for wealth, source for righteousness, and wellness. Yeah. But look at verse 19 and 20. Oftentimes in these letters... Jesus has a word of encouragement, and then he brings in his word of condemnation. And so far, this whole letter for the Laodiceans is all condemnation. He says, verse 19, I like this, because as Pastor Dustin was mentioning last night in the invitation, that a loving father is going to discipline his children. He would not love them if he did not discipline them. And here we see that Jesus is attempting to discipline his church so that they can live more like him. He says, as many as I love, say love with me, love. love. You know, this word comes from the Greek word agape. Can you say agape with me? Agape. You didn't know you'd be learning Greek tonight, huh? I know it's all Greek to us, right? But hey, the word agape is, is like the highest form of love that we could attain. It is God's love. Many times the King James translates that word as charity. It is a high form of love. And in this particular passage, we see that God is demonstrating that He has a high view of humanity and a great love for them. And in this moment, He says, Because I love you, I'm rebuking you and chastening you. And He says, Be zealous, therefore. And He says this, Repent. This word means to change and reverse your mentality about what you're doing and conform yourself to the way in which Jesus Christ lived. In other words, we, we come to God, yes, by faith. We do. Salvation is by grace through faith. We understand that. And we come in repentant in a repentant spirit saying, God, I've broken your word. God, I've sinned. God, I confess to you that I have sinned against you and you alone as David did in Psalm 51. But then check it out now, verse 20. I find this so mesmerizing. We often use verse 20 when we're out knocking on doors or sharing the gospel with people. We do. We use it as a means by which we can admonish lost people to come to faith in Christ. But, but notice the context in this, in this passage. Jesus, hey, he's not talking about to the he's not talking to these Roman pagans who are worshiping Caesar as a god. He's actually talking to the Laodicean church, and he says to them, "Behold, I'm standing at your door, and I'm knocking, Laodiceans. And if you would open your door to me, I will come in and sit down and eat." I share with you before, but I'll, I'll repeat it again: that in the ancient world, one of the highest forms of relational aspects of life back then, was sitting down at a table and eating dinner together. And so what Jesus is saying is you have deprived me, who have given you a church and given you life, you're depriving me of the most intimate thing that I could be involved in in your life. You're refusing me to sit down at the table with you. Now I find this interesting. I'm not saying we cannot use this verse for soul winning. We should. We should invite sinners to open their door to their hearts to trust Jesus as Savior. But in this context, this church has become so self-sufficient, 
so self-reliant and so self-dependent, they did not see their need for God in their life. And so they closed the door, and they locked the door, they, they turned the doorknob, they turned the deadbolt, and they threw the key away. And Jesus is at the door, and he's knocking, knocking. I wonder, what are we doing today in the American church? We're doing the exact same thing. We have greater programs than the proclamation of the gospel. We have greater schemes of music with all the different fluff and stuff instead of just singing some Christ-honoring worship songs or hymns. We have all these preachers who tell these great fancy stories and tickle our ears, and I call it cotton candy preaching. Yeah, it tastes good and it feels good, but it doesn't give you sustenance to live the Christian life. My friends, we need to get back to the idea that, that Jesus is declaring His lovingly disciplined action because He wants His church to be forgiven by His grace. Forgiveness is only found in Jesus. But now, may I draw your attention to verse 21 and 22? It is in this particular section of Scripture that we see the idea of blessedness. The word blessed comes from the Greek and Hebrew, and it means somebody who is blissfully happy beyond all earthly understanding. Now certainly I understand that if somebody gave you a nice Mercedes Benz, you would be a pretty happy camper. If somebody gave you a lottery ticket and you won that 600 and some million dollar that they're offering, I'm telling you, man, we'd all be happy. We'd retire and say goodbye, we're going to go buy an island and then live there. But I'll tell you something, at some point along the way in your life, that happiness can be drained by somebody ridiculing you or somebody causing division in your life or something bad happening. I'm here to tell you something, that true blessedness is only found in Jesus Christ. And here it says that, that the only way you can overcome this spirit of the lukewarm mentality of saying, hey God, I don't need you because I've got everything that I need. I'm here to tell you something. You will only have what you need when you have Christ in your life. Here it says, to him that overcomes. This word overcome, by the way, comes from a Greek word that we get the word Nike from. Yeah, just do it is not original to the American mindset or even to Michael Jordan. It's actually original to the ancient world and the writers of the New Testament. To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. Huh. So far, we haven't seen a direct emphasis of the gospel in this text until now. Did you see that? Jesus says, even, also, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Do, do, do you see what's going on right now? In this moment of this passage, Jesus is saying there was a time when I overcame. Well, what's, what did he overcome? My brothers and sisters, this is a direct reference to the gospel here in this passage. Jesus is saying there was a time when I came, I was wrapped with swaddling clothes, and I was laid in a manger. I was born uh, um, uh, with, a, with a miraculous conception, and Mary was just a young lady. And there, they didn't have room in the inn, and they took uh, the, the Mary and Joseph, and they brought them into the inn in Bethlehem. And there, I was born in a stable, and the shepherds came, and, and these people in the community, they came, and they witnessed, and, and I lived. And when I was about 12 years old, guess what? I went into the temple and began to question these Pharisees and Sadducees and they were, were, were in wonder of, of me because, because of what I had to share. And as he went on, we know that he was taken off into the wilderness and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights by the enemy and then he began his three, three and a half year ministry where he raised those who were dead. He healed those who were sick. He walked on water and, and guess what? He went to the cross and he died on Calvary's cross and there he was brutally crucified for our sins so that guilty sinners could come to faith in Christ and, and receive forgiveness. And he was placed in Joseph's tomb. I mean, I'm telling you, Jesus was quite a figure. He had no car. I mean, he didn't have a camel, perhaps. He didn't have the nicest chariot to ride down the road. He didn't have any of these things. We are, we are not told that he had a house. We are not told that he had proper education. We are not told that he had all these things in life that make him successful. He did not get married. He did not have any children. And there he is. He became the figure that time surrounds his life. 
We have A.D. and we have B.C. We have songs, uh, more songs that are written about him than any other figure in history. More books are written about Jesus than any other person in the world. I'm here to tell you something. Jesus was quite a guy. And the reason why he was quite a guy is because he was the Messiah. I couldn't overcome the power of sin. You couldn't overcome the power of sin. It was Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. When God the Father poured out His holy wrath upon Him. Jesus, in a sense, experienced hell so that we could experience life. And they placed Him in that tomb. You know that story that we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks. Next weekend, in fact. They sealed Him and they put guards to make sure that these Jews... These apostles would not come, roll the stone away, take his body, and claim he had risen. At some point early Sunday morning, these ladies come to the tomb. And I find it interesting that God used women to first see the risen Savior. You understand in the ancient world? In many aspects, a woman in the ancient world was viewed as a lesser in society. In a court of law, their testimony was not considered legitimate. And so God, providentially and sovereignly, brings those ladies to the tomb. There to see the bright shining light that frightened the soldiers. And they're laying on the ground scared half to death. And there they walk into the tomb after the angels. They come and see where he lay because, listen, he's not here. He's risen. And there they saw it was empty. And then Jesus calls them by their name. They were the first to publish the news that Jesus Christ had overcome death and the grave. And here he says, he overcame. It was those ladies who first told the other apostles that Jesus, the one we believed in so strongly, has no longer had been affected by the sting and torments of death. He had risen, and for 40 days they saw him, they witnessed him, and there he was. And then... He ascended up to glory. This is a passage implies His death and His resurrection and His ascension when it says that He sat down with my Father in His, in his throne. Now, now, so many times I've read this passage, this one and others, it says, I mean, consider, think about this. Jesus, if Jesus was God incarnate and there's a holy trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, they're, they're all one, they have different functions, but they're one being. How could Jesus be sitting beside the Father on His throne? I thought to myself, what? What's going on here? Well, in the ancient world, if Caesar is sitting on his throne, whoever's sitting on his right hand is given equal authority and equal ability. So if that person goes out and does something in the name of Caesar, it was as if Caesar did it. So, this is a figure of speech to realize, for us to understand that God the Father, God the Son are equal in authority and ability. And he overcame. And it says this, verse 22. He says, if you have ears to hear, listen. Jesus declares his church will reign with him in blessedness. Jesus declares he alone extends forgiveness. Jesus declares He is the source for wealth, righteousness, and wellness. Jesus is crying out to this church and saying, You are useless. I want you to be useful. He is the faithful, eternal, true witness. As I was meditating in this passage and reading some commentaries, I came across something that I have to read to you because it really rattled my cage. I wonder... This person I'm about to describe to you. Do you know who this one is? Listen very carefully. A certain man was adopted son of the princess. 
and the princess was daughter to the world's most powerful king. They knew affluence. They knew resources. They knew prestige, fine food, and stylish clothing. In worldly terms, they lacked nothing. As the young man grew, he was educated and cultivated. There were girls. There were privileges. There were family expectations. There were possibilities. There were the concerns of the realm. But he left it all. He had something greater, more valuable, something that would make enjoying everything he had a waste of his life. Do you know this man? His name was Moses. I'm afraid we are often too much like the Laodicean church and not enough like Moses. We say, God, we are doing just fine without you. But I want you to understand, we will not experience the outpouring of the Spirit of God unless we come to a point in our life when we say, God, we can't do anything unless you intervene. I close with what Jesus said. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Would you bow your hearts with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? God, we come before you right now thanking you for the power of the gospel. How it has power to take root in our lives and to change us for all eternity. And Father, I pray right now that if there's somebody here this evening, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, who's never experienced the life-changing power of the gospel, God, I pray that tonight would be the night that they lift up their voice and they say, God, have mercy, have mercy upon me, for I am a sinner. Father, for my brothers and sisters that are here tonight who have struggled in their walk with you, whether it's an earthly trial they're going through or whatever it might be, maybe spiritual warfare, whatever it is, God, I ask that you right now would step into their life and by your Holy Spirit and your word, you will fulfill the need. God, we ask right now that in this invitation, you would have your will and your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is Jesus knocking at your heart's door? Many of you have seen the picture before. I know this is probably no, not really how it really was. But you all see the picture. A lot of times you go to somebody's house and you'll see a picture of Jesus standing there and you'll see him knocking at the door. That represents Jesus knocking at your heart's door. Is Jesus knocking at your heart's door? If there's something in your life that you need, come, open up, let him in as we stand. I'm not going to preach another message like yesterday. If there's a need in your life, why don't you come, talk to me, talk to Pastor Talk to either one of us. We'll be happy to take you for the Bible. We'll be happy to pray with you. We'll be happy to help you. Whatever we can do to help you out. Help you get to the point where you realize that Jesus is real. Help you get that peace that you need. We'll share your scriptures from the Bible. We'll take you to pass. We'll help you out whatever you need. Jesus is there for you. Number three, five, four, nine.
tonight. I tell you, I learned something. I didn't realize about the springs. I was like you were for many years. I never realized about the, the cold springs and the hot springs. I feel like I got a lot of studying to do. We're always learning. The more you get inside the Word of God, the more you start digging, the more you'll learn. You'll never come to a point where you figured everything out. And uh, I'm happy to say that I learned something. I hope, hope you learned something tonight, too. And I hope it was a blessing to you. I do have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, our Easter egg hunt is Easter Sunday. We're going to need, the, if you're going to donate some candy, we need it by next Sunday. We're going to need the candy penny usually tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, I need it by tomorrow. So we need that to give that to Penny. Also, uh, we are going to have an adult Sunday school class Sunday. We normally just have a kids class. We're going to bump that up a little bit to 10 o'clock. I know originally 10, 15. We're going to bump it up to uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Be here. They'll have a kids class with uh, Robbie and the girls, and then Pastor Brian will be teaching our adult class at 10 o'clock, so be here, set your alarms a little bit early, be here for Sunday school, it'll be a good time, and uh, so uh, Sunday is Palm Sunday, so I'm expecting a lot of visitors here, and uh, be in pray for the uh, pamphlets and the flyers that we handed out, and uh, we'll pray, then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we want to thank you for your love your mercy, your grace, and just thank you for everything that you've done in our lives, and just continue to be with us, guide us, and direct us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.